Welcome back everyone. This week I'll be considering a simple, very easy to understand intuitive topic. It's a classification technique, at least that's the way I'll be covering it in this week. Uh, this technique can be used for both prediction and classification, but I'll just look at the classification aspect now. We'll look at the prediction aspect later. This technique is called as the K nearest neighbors technique and we'll get right on with it. Okay, so let's say we've got a neighborhood and let's assume that this rectangle represents a geographical neighborhood and there are lots of households in this neighborhood and I'll be representing the households by circles. And just for example, because it's a classification problem, let's consider classifying people as Republicans or Democrats. So let's say we've got a bunch of households. These are actually the geographical locations of various households. And let's say all of these households represent people who vote Republican. Okay, so once again, this is geographical and therefore the layout is exactly as it might be on a, uh, in a certain neighborhood. And let's say you've got another set of households who vote, let's say, Democrat. And these are, you know, this is one neighborhood where you've got a bunch of people who vote Republican and a bunch of people who vote Democrat. And the actual locations of their houses are actually shown here. Okay, again, uh, I'm using this as a simple example for classification. So now let's say we are given two households A and B as shown in the diagram. Okay, so we've got two households A and B and let's say we don't know their political affiliation. We don't know the political affiliation of A or B. And let's say we would like to make a prediction or a classification of those two points. Okay, of course, the idea here is that if you consider point A, it has predominantly Republican neighborhoods, Republican neighbors. Okay, most of the neighbors are Republican and therefore we might classify this point as a Republican. Of course, we can never be 100% sure but we are saying, look, predominantly the households in that part of town seem to be Republican. Therefore, our best guess for this particular household would be that they vote Republican. That's the idea here. Similarly, you've got another household here, B. Most of its neighbors are Democrat. So let's say we classify them as Democrat. The K nearest neighbors technique essentially takes this intuition and formalizes it into a data mining technique. So again, what we are saying is given a point whose classification we do not know, we'll consider the neighboring points and classify our point according to which classification predominates in its neighborhood. That's the whole idea. But of course, the notion of neighborhood is very easy to understand in the context of geographical neighborhoods where you can actually consider physical distance as representative of a neighborhood. But how do you apply this principle to data that represents something other than geographical data? So several questions arise when we talk about applying this intuition of neighborhood to general data. So first question, of course, is even when you're considering just geographical distance information, how many neighbors should we consider? Should we consider just one neighbor or should we consider five neighbors or 10 neighbors or 100 neighbors? So that's one issue that we need to consider. So for example, if you consider too few neighboring points, then we might simply latch on to noise in the data. So for example, take this point A here. In fact, if you consider just a single neighbor, the closest neighbor to A happens to be a point that is not generally representative of the neighborhood. Most of the neighbors of A are actually Republican, but the closest point happens to be a Democrat. 
So if you take just a single point, a single neighbor, then you'll end up classifying A as actually a Democrat. So the point is, the single Democrat which is close to A happens to be actually noise and not signal because that is not representative of the general area. So the point is, if you consider too few neighbors, then you might end up latching onto noise rather than to actual information. But if you consider too many neighbors, so in this case, let us say to classify A, we consider 100 neighbors or to classify B, we consider 100 neighbors and then take the majority. So in that case, what will happen is that you will simply go with the majority vote and you will not be able to catch on or to use local information. So that's the trade off. If you have too little neighbors, too few neighbors, then there's a problem in that you may not catch the trend or the general uh, idea of the neighborhood. But if you consider too many neighbors, then you will just get a very general picture and you lose, lose the local flavor. So there's a trade off involved here and we'll see how we handle that trade off as we progress. So that's one important point about this. So let's now consider all of this and take a concrete example. So let's say we've got information about some people. Once again, this is information that is made up just to be illustrative. So we've got information about various people's incomes and the number of cars they own. And we also have information about whether or not they own a boat. Okay, so that's the information we have. And let's say we are trying to We've got information now about new people whose incomes and number of cars we know, but we would like to predict whether or not they're likely to be candidates to buy a boat based on information about income and cars. So we'll be applying the usual data mining techniques of using a model, uh, using the training data to build a model, and then we'll validate the model and then test the model. That's what we'll be trying to do. Okay, so here, the information we have here is not geographical information. Okay, so let's consider a concrete task. Let's say we've got a person whose income is 85,000 and who has two cars. So what would be our best classification for this particular person? Would this person be a likely owner of a boat or not likely to be an owner of a boat or to be interested in buying a boat? Alternately, we can talk about given a person with income 85,000 and having two cars, what is the probability that this person would be interested in buying a boat? Okay, so that's really what we are considering. So here, what do we mean by distance? In the case of geographic neighborhoods, we could say distance is simply the distance between two points. Whereas in this case, the notion of distance is not all that clear. But of course, we've talked about this in some of the earlier lectures. So you may already have an idea of where we are going with this. Okay. So we need to find out how do we compute the neighbors of this point, 85,000 income and two cars. What exactly do we mean by neighbors? So we are interested in the notion of distance. So let's take a concrete example. As before, we are considering the distance between our point, 85,000 income and two cars, and the first point on our data, which is 95,000 income and one car. So can we get a measure of what is the distance between these two points? How far away are these two points? Of course, we've already seen that we can use the Euclidean uh, notion of a distance, and we know how to calculate that. We'll take the two x coordinates, take the square difference, take the two y coordinates or the second coordinate, take the different square difference, add them up and take the square root. This is the notion of Euclidean distance that we've already looked at. So you could do this. And that gives us a notion of distance between two points, even though the two points have no geographical uh, interpretation. Okay, so in KNN classification, what we're really trying to do is to consider the distance between points and then consider for a given point, K nearest neighbors, where we choose the value of K. K stands for how many? neighbors. And then based on that, we'll do the classification. It's as simple as that. But just to be clear that we understand what's going on, because we are using KNN as a classification technique, obviously the target variable has to be categorical, right? We are not trying to predict a number. 
to say this person will buy five boats or 10 boats or the price of this product is going to be something. What is the dollar value of the price and so on? That's not what we're trying to do here. We are simply trying to classify a given person as a person who is likely to be interested in a boat or not, or is already you know, a boat owner or not, or a person who's likely to vote Republican or Democratic, or a person who's likely to accept a loan offer or not. So these are all classification to uh, topics, to tasks, and therefore we are interested in the cat in the target variable being a categorical variable. However, since we are talking about the notion of neighbors or distance, obviously the predictor variables have to be numerical variables. Okay, so when you try to apply K and N or K nearest neighbors technique for classification, you need categorical target variable. You need a categorical target variable, but you need numerical predictors. Shortly, we will look at how to handle the situations where we don't have this available and yet we want to use KNN for classification. Okay, as I've discussed before, this technique is also applicable for numerical predictions, but we'll discuss that later in the course. Okay, so let's take some examples of distance calculations. Let's say we've got our initial two data sets, uh, two points of data. So one person has an income of 95,000 and has one car. Another person has an income of 85,000 and has two cars. What's the distance? If you use Excel or whatever it is and calculate the distance, you'll find that the distance between these two points is very close to 10,000 10, units, right? Because here you've got income, a number of cars, two things combined. So this distance is not really a geographical distance, but it's just some notion of distance between these two points. Okay, now consider that the income increases by 50. So this person has an income of 95,000 and another person has an income of 95,050, one car. This person has an income of 85,000 and two cars. Okay, so we see that the two points are not radically different. A very, very minor difference between the two. Income is increased by 50 over a base of 95,000. So it's a really small increase in income. And we now see that the distance between the two points is 10,050. Now let's consider another, another point where the income is back to the original 95,000, but the number of cars has gone up to three, which is a significant increase over the previous value of 95,000 and one car, right? Because it's gone up from one car all the way to three cars. That's a huge difference between the two points. But if you calculate the distance, you'll see that the distance is still really, really close to 10,000. And again, if you consider even five cars, 95,000 and five cars, and still compare the distance with the old point of 85,002, you find the distance is still 10,000. So the net result is that the distance calculations are dominated by income and are completely insensitive to the number of cars. Okay, so even if there's a large variation in the number of cars, that gets dwarfed by the dimensions of income, because income is measured in large quantities. Unfortunately, this is a problem because uh, income tends to dominate here, the distance calculations. Okay, now suppose we change the units in which we measure income. So instead of calculating the income as in, in you know, 95,000, suppose we say we're going to calculate it in, in terms of number of thousands. So the first one will be 95. So the two initial two points would be 95 and one and 85 and two. Okay, so when you change the, the units, then the distance completely changes and the relative ordering of points could be totally affected by changing the units. Okay, so this is not a great idea. It, it's, in, it's very sensitive to one variable and completely insensitive to another variable. And of course, as we've already discussed, what we're going to do for this is to scale the variables. Right, so that we don't allow one variable to dominate. And we've already discussed this in an earlier lecture, so I'll go, go through this quickly. So what you do for scaling is you calculate the mean, you calculate the standard deviation, and then you consider for every point how many standard deviations away it is from the mean. So you take the point, for example, 43,789, subtract the mean from it, and divide that by the standard deviation. 
okay that tells us how many standard deviations away from the mean a given point is and of course this value could be negative or positive and then we put the resultant values as the normalized values i've shown one example but of course the same calculation has been carried out for all the points so now what will happen is if you take the income and normalize it and then if you take the number of cars and normalize that as well then you will find that a single variable cannot dominate the distance calculations as much so if the number of cars goes up from one to five it will register as a big difference and if the income goes from let's say 95,000 to 95,050 that difference will now be shown up as being completely insignificant so that's the idea of normalization or scaling so when you apply the technique of k nearest neighbors in fact any technique that depends upon distance calculations we'll have to first normalize the data to prevent one or two variables from dominating the outcome uh, in case you're starting to wonder you know these calculations seem to be pretty tedious of how do i do that well the good news is in our commander you can do this directly as we'll see when we do our hands-on lab okay so therefore just to summarize if you're using the k nearest neighbor technique for either classification or prediction you must first normalize all the variables otherwise your results may not be uh, as good as you intend them to be so that's one important consideration okay so distance obviously implies that you want numerical predictors because you're trying to calculate distance now what if some of your predictor variables are categorical what do you do that's an issue as well that we need to consider right so so let's say you've got a problem of classification you're thinking of using the nearest neighbor technique but unfortunately, some of your predictor variables, some or all of your predictor variables happen to be categorical. And therefore, directly with categorical variables, it's difficult or impossible to calculate the distance. So we need some way to handle that. Let's consider this. Again, this is something we have discussed earlier. Uh, this is the technique of dummy variables, and that's what we'll be looking at. So here, let's say we've got a data set, and one of our predictor variables happens to be status. And status is a categorical variable, and it happens to be, uh, you know, student, unemployed, retired, uh, and so on, employed. Those are the four different values. So that's clearly categorical. But if you want to apply the k-nearest neighbor technique to this data, then we need to make that status numeric. How do we do that? Well, we do that by using dummy variable. So dummies will come to our rescue in solving this particular problem okay so let's take an example again this example we've looked at already earlier so when you've got a data set like this with a categorical variable which you want to convert into numerical variable then the resulting data set will look like this notice what has happened is that this categorical variable has four different values student unemployed retired and employed what has now happened is that those values have become columns in our changed data set okay and take the first case the first case represents a person who's 23 years of age and is a student and therefore we see the age still as 23 but we have a one under student to indicate that this person is a student and we've got zeros for all the remaining values unemployed employed etc so let's take one more example. Let's say we take this person who's 39 years old. That person is employed. And therefore, we see that there's a one under employed. Okay. So this is the way in which we take categorical variables and convert them into numerical variables. So again, just to see what, ha what has happened. So the different values of the categorical variable status have now become attributes or variables. And each of them has a value of zero or one to capture with what the actual value of a particular row is of course you will notice that one of them will be zero and all the rest will be one uh, one of them will be one all the rest would be zero because a person cannot be let's say in this example a person can have only one status uh, and therefore only one of these values can be one notice also that not all the values of the categorical variable are reflected as columns 
Here, you've got four possibilities, student, unemployed, retired, and employed, but we've included only three values here. The reason is that the fourth value is indicated by all of these three, these three values being zero. So if you included a fourth value and had that as one or zero, that would actually be redundant because just three are enough to show all the possibilities because you make three, all of them zero, then it represents the fourth possibility. So for example, what is the value of this person? Uh, what is the status of this person whose age is 58? If you look at the actual data, you see that this person is a retired person and therefore you see that student, unemployed, employed are all zero, which means that this person is not any of those and therefore the person is retired. So that is why when you convert categorical variables to dummy variables, you will represent one less than the actual number of possibilities for the categorical variable. So if there are n possibilities for the categorical variables, you will have n minus one dummy variables. This is just the way it's done. Okay, just to make sure that you understand the idea, take this example, again, it's something that you've done before. So this is more like a recap. And here we've got a categorical variable called gender. And what I'd invite you to do now is to stop the video and do exactly what was done on the previous slide for this single categorical variable. In other words, convert this data set into a data set which has a dummy variable or dummy variables, depending on how many you want to have, okay, uh, to represent gender. So I would say stop it, stop the video, convert it, and then proceed to the next slide. Okay. So of course, we've got our answer. And this is the original data. And this will get converted into this. Since there are two possibilities for gender, female and male, We'll represent only one of them. Remember, we want to use n minus 1. So n is 2, female and male. So we'll have just a single variable. And let's say we could call the variable female or male, depending on our preference. It doesn't really matter. And in this case, I have chosen to uh, represent the variable by the female value. And therefore, all the females would be represented by 1, and all the males would be represented by 0. And those are the two possibilities. OK, so that's the way you convert. Uh, categorical variables into numerical variables by introducing dummy variables. So once again, just to recap, if you're using k-nearest neighbors technique, either for classification or for prediction, clearly distance calculations are involved. But suppose you've got categorical or uh, categorical input or predictive variables, then clearly based on what we have discussed, you have to convert those categorical or uh, input or predictive variables into dummy variables, which become numeric, and then distance calculations can proceed as normal. Okay, so to summarize, when you're using KNN for classification, we need a categorical output variable. The output variable has to be categorical because we are trying to classify. And the input variables are, of course, supposed to be numeric, so what do you do if your output variable is not categorical? Suppose you, you've got a situation where you want to use KNN for classification, but for whatever reason, your output variable is numeric. Then what do you do? You use a technique called binning, which we'll discuss in the next slide. So we'll use a technique called binning to convert numerical variables to categorical variables. Or of course, you could say, well, since the output variable is numeric, I, I will not use KNN for classification. Instead, I could use KNN for prediction. You could do that as well. But if you're hell-bent on using classification, then you have to take this numerical output variable and convert it into a categorical output variable by binning, which we'll discuss on the next slide. So if uh, the KNN technique in general, classification or prediction, requires numerical input variables, what do you do if your input variable is not numerical, if it is categorical? That we've already seen. You need to convert it into dummy, convert all the categorical variables into dummy variables. So that's a general summary of what kind of input and output variables you need in order to be able to apply the k-nearest neighbors technique 
for classification. Let's take a look at binning. I said that if you've got output variables which are numerical, but you want them to be categorical so that you can use classification, then you use the technique of binning. Nothing complicated. Suppose you've got an original data of this form. Doesn't matter what the numbers are. This is obviously numeric. It's not categorical. But suppose this is the target variable and you want to bin it, then you could use a technique like this. So for example, you could say between 0 and 50, I'm going to call it as A. Between 50 and 100, I'm going to call it as B, etc., etc. So those are the bins. And now you see that the values A, B, C, D, E are completely categorical. Your input data would then reach this proportion in terms of binning. Okay, that's how the binned output data would look. So now instead of being numbers, your data fall into five different categories. And you can now use a categorical uh, a technique that does classification. So this is the way in which you would convert numerical data to categorical data. Earlier, we saw a technique for converting categorical data to numerical data by using dummy variables. Okay, So it's possible for us to convert variables in either direction. Now let's move on to a concrete example where we apply the k nearest neighbors technique to a real problem. Once again, we are back to our good old riding mowers data set. So we've got information about income of people. You've got the information about lot size of the houses uh, they own, of the properties they own. And of course, we've got our target variable indicating whether or not they own a riding mower. And our technique, uh, our goal here is to build a model to predict or to classify people as either owners or non-owners of riding mowers given the income and lot size. Okay, So therefore, our input variables are income and lot size and the output variable is prediction, uh, is a classification of whether or not they own a riding mower. Let's say this is our original data and of course, like good data miners, our initial step is to normalize the data. Remember, here we've got incomes and lot sizes. Both are in completely different dimensions. They are in different scales. And therefore, if you use the data as it is, incomes are generally much larger here than lot sizes. And therefore, incomes will tend to dominate our distance calculations. So we want to normalize it. And here we show the normalized uh, information for income and lot size. I'm calling them normalized income and normalized lot size. Uh, later on, I'll show you in the hands-on lab, I'll show you how to do this normalization using our commander. So this is our normalized information, normalized income, normalized lot size and ownership. And K, the K nearest neighbors technique requires us to use three partitions. Now, some of the techniques we used earlier required us to use only two partitions, a training partition and a validation partition. But in the k-nearest neighbors technique, you will shortly see that we actually have to use two partitions to simply build the model. So the training and validation partitions both will be used to build the model. And then we'll use the test partition to, to see how good the model really is. So let's say we have taken this data, created a training partition with 12 rows. We've got 24 rows of data here. So our training partition has 12 rows, validation with six rows, and test with another six rows. So we've just taken this original data, partitioned it into training, validation, and test. Now we'll see how exactly the modeling process proceeds. So clearly, what we're going to do is to build a model and in this case, building a model really says, what is the value for k? That's all the model is. So we'll see how it works. So what we're going to do is to take each case in the validation partition and attempt to classify the case. So for example, we'll take this first case right here. Normalized income is minus 0.457 and normalized lot size as minor and classifying it using information in the training partition. So for example, we'll take this particular row here, minus 0.457, minus 
and calculate its closest k nearest neighbors in the training partition and then classify it based on majority of the neighbors. That's what we're going to do and we'll sh see shortly concretely how this is done. Okay, so we've got our training partition here and we've got the validation partition there and what we're going to do is to take the first row here and let's say to begin with we use a k value of 3. You may say why 3? Well, we could have started with 1 and then gone to 2 and 3 and so on. Just to illustrate, I want to show k equals 3. So consider this row, minus 0.457, minus uh, 1.215. It happens to be a non-owner in reality, but we're not going to look at that. We're just going to try and classify this. So in order to do that, since we have chosen a k value of 3, we'll find the closest three neighbors to this point. We already know how to calculate the distance. We'll apply that same formula and calculate its closest neighbors. So the closest neighbor happens to be this particular point, minus 0.275 minus 1.709. That makes sense because uh, the income is negative, the lot size is negative, and both are pretty close to the original value. So that's the closest point that we've got in terms of distance calculation. The next closest point happens to be this one. And the third closest point happens to be that one. So those are the three closest neighbors we want to consider. And we've chosen three because k is three. So we've looked at only three neighbors. So given that these are the three neighbors for this point, how will we classify this point? Would we classify this point as an owner or as a non-owner? Now, the way to do that is among the neighbors, we see which is the majority. In this case, it so happens that all the three neighbors closest points to this particular point, all of them are non-owners. So it's a no-brainer because of the majority, we'll classify this case as a non-owner. Okay. And of course, it turns out to be correct because in reality too, this is a non-owner. So the classification worked. So in building a model, this is exactly what we're going to be doing in the K nearest neighbors technique. We take the validation, we first pick a value for K. Okay, now the way we are going to do it is we pick a value for K and classify every case of the validation partition just like I've shown you now. For every case of the validation partition, find the K nearest neighbors and classify the case according to the majority of uh, the classification of the k nearest neighbors. Do that for the entire validation partition for a given value of k. So let's say we start with k equals 1. Do this for the entire validation partition. And of course, once you've done that, you've got the actual value of ownership and you will then have the predicted value of ownership for every case. So based on those two, you can build an error matrix for that value of k. You can say with k equals 1, this was how the model did. Then we go on and repeat the same process for k equals 2 and get the error matrix. k equals 3, get the error matrix, k equals 4, and so on. So we repeat this for several values of k on the same validation data. So for every row on the validation data, we are going to find its k closest neighbors in the training data and perform the classification. But we're going to repeat this process for many different values of k and for every value of k we are going to see the resulting error matrix and then finally we say okay this is the value of k i want to choose because this is the error matrix that i like of the lot so the best performing value of k is what we are going to choose and then we'll see how that performs on the test partition this is the way the whole technique actually works it's very simple very straightforward so just to summarize, this is the overall process for the k-nearest neighbors technique. We first take our data, normalize it. Let's assume that we've already got our predictor data as numerical variables and the target variable already converted into categorical variables. Let's say we've already done that and now we're starting the process. So first we normalize the data and then we create three partitions training, validation, test. Then we choose a value of k, some value of k, let's say we start with k equals 1. And then for every validation case, 
find the k nearest neighbors in the training data set and classify the case according to the majority. And then having done this for one particular value of k, we build the error matrix for that particular value of k. And then we see, have we tried all the different possible values of k we would like to try? If it is yes, then we stop. Otherwise, we go back, choose the next value of k and repeat this whole process. So let's say we tried five different values of k. At the end of this process, we'll have five different error matrices. And out of these, what we want to do is to choose the one whose performance is the best of the lot. Let's say the one with the lowest overall error rate or if one kind of error is better than another kind of error, then we can apply our judgment and say, well, I want a model that performs better on these kinds of cases rather than in those kinds of cases. And then we choose the best performing K and that's really our model. 